to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is our presentation, Reaching Out by Reaching In, Outreach as Community Building Inside and Outside the Library. Okay, so quick intros. Uh, my name is Steph Yoon. I'm a PPT library aide. I work in the teen zone at our main branch in Oakland, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Cool. My name is Andrea Guzman. I'm a library assistant in the community relations office of the Oakland Public Library and currently an MLIS student. Hi, my name is Peggy Simmons. I am a permanent part-time library assistant working for teen services for the Oakland Public Library. Um, my main task, but not my only task, is uh, running the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate Program. Okay, so real quick, like just kind of thinking to yourselves, uh, we want to do a roll call, like who's in the room? So librarians, paraprofessionals, public, academics, supervisors, managers, the places that you work. Um, we imagine maybe a lot of librarians in the room, but thinking about like who do we want in these spaces and who has access to being able to come to a really cool conference like this. So just think about that, especially as you send folks off to professional development opportunities. Kind of keep that with you throughout the presentation. Raise your hand if you're a paraprofessional, real quick. Uh -huh. Hey, yeah. hey, Woo. see you. Glad to see right. so many. And our librarians, where are you at? Yeah, showing up. All right. Okay, we okay. Hope this will be useful. So we get a sense of who's in the room right now. So we're talking about outreach, um, and we're thinking that, as demonstrated by this uh, GIF, Maybe your outreach looks like this. You give someone a flyer, maybe they're not super juiced about it, and that's the end of your day, mission accomplished, right? Maybe not. So we wanna talk about outreach, not just as giving out flyers and kind of measuring numbers of how many people we've reached, but really um, building relationships and being able to kind of keep outreach not only sustainable for you and your staff, but also figuring out how you can build those relationships in community and how that will come back to you quantified in different ways that might not be as easily measured, but will really come back to benefit your community and the library as an institution. Yes. Okay, so, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we're all in a rush and we're all kind of trying to get things done and there isn't all the hours in the day to build those relationships with people if you're just handing out flyers really frantically and that's kind of the job. So really, we want to talk about how are ways that you can spend more time and energy into getting to know the people that come to your libraries, getting to know the people that work with you, especially your non-librarian staff who most likely represent the communities that you're serving and also have lots of skills and relationships that maybe not might be, they might not be as tapped into as they could be and making sure it's also like an equitable and um, sustainable and fair relationship to your non librarian staff as well. So I know that uh, lots of us work really hard on our uh, annual reports. Um, the data is very important. Um, however, pleasing just the stakeholders or the folks who may not even come or use your library. Um, and you know, putting pictures of brown kids, great. You know, like all the optics are fine. Um, but ultimately, it, it's really corny if you're not actually being authentic about the relationships that you're building, right? So. The good data is gonna come from good relationship building. Um, so it's really important for us not to just focus on those numbers, right? But the actual relationships that we're building. So we're gonna give you two different examples of programs that uh, might not have been considered outreach, but are really wonderful outreach programs that are run at the Oakland Public Library, and they have been run um, in large part, not completely, but in large part by paraprofessional staff. Um, I'm going to interject right here, too, that I just want you all to know that we pr first prepared this presentation for CLA last year. Maybe some of you saw it. And we had 90 minutes, and so now we're getting 90 minutes into 20 minutes. So um, excuse me if I start to talk really fast. All of us. <laughs> <laughs> so the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate Program um, started in 2012. Uh, Steph didn't mention it before, but Steph is actually Oakland's first Youth Poet Laureate. They are the 2012 <laughs> Poet Laureate. We'll be starting to look for our ninth Youth Poet Laureate in January. 
Um, it's for ages 13 to 18, uh, youth in Oakland, and all kinds of kids, all kinds of poets come to the program. And we're developing the program very purposefully now um, to be more of a community of young poets supporting each other rather than one winner who gets a $5,000 scholarship. We really it naturally developed that way, but we're doing it much more purposefully now, or we're figuring out how to do it much more purposefully. But over those, over, over those seven, eight, eight years, um, the program has grown enormously. The 2018 Youth Poet Laureate, Layla Motley, uh, she, so she was laureate for one year, um, she had a video made of one of her poems um, by YR Media that got 91,000 views just on Facebook. When was the last time you did a program that reached 91,000 people? Um, so that was huge. She performed all, all kinds of places. Uh, we don't have a great count, but she definitely, in that year, was in front of more than 2,000 people. S this year, we have 10 finalists, so we're working with this group of finalists. Um, they were named in April, and in the past six months since, since they were named, they have been at 21 different events around town. And in addition to those 21 events, the laureates um, themselves uh, were in front of 12 more, uh, were in 12 more events, performed at 12 more events. Um, and so that was 33 different events just in the past six months that these young people uh, performed at. And that was at schools, business events, churches, senior centers, street fairs, museum events, et cetera. These young people got to speak their truth, um, their beauty, their stories um, in front of all kinds of people in the past, hundreds of people in the past six months. So, I mean, when you're talking, and the library's behind all of that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more that, about that in a second, but um, Steph's gonna say a couple things about yeah, what the so program is. Yeah, something I, I really would love to speak to you about the program um, is that like, especially in this time and age where I hear it all the time, like with people, they're like, oh, what relevance does libraries have? Don't they just have books and that's it? Don't they still use like the card system? Um, and this is one way in which like you can show folks, like having programs like these, um, show folks that like, no, the library is a lot more than just books. Like the books are really important. Yeah, and all the information you can get is really important, but it's also a community hub in general and like, us being able to go out into the community and not like trying to shove people into our branches, which we'd like them to go there eventually, but like trying to get that first point of contact, that interaction is really, really important. And for me, like the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate program was my first like real kind of thought and like folding into library work because I've been in the libraries like as a kid and I like used it pretty regularly, but like seeing the kind of work that they were doing, seeing them support a program like this, I kind of thought more about like, I could see myself working and wanting to support that kind of work because it's in alignment with what I want to do. So being able to show your patrons and community, like there's so much more that's available at the library that they might not already know about, that you're already doing in whatever like uh, programs and awesome things that you plan to do in the future and especially getting their input is really important. So that's the piece I want to mention. <laughs> Great. Um, so the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate program that the library is running is developing opportunities, skills, communication, peer support, et cetera, for these young people. It's a wonderful program for the young people. Um, we are massively elevating the voices of these young people, and again, very different young people from different parts of Oakland. We're partnering with each one of those events, those 33 events, that was 33 people organizing events who now we have relationships with. Um, some better than others, um, but that's an amazing way to partner with people. Um, we're reaching new people all the time and we're building community. If, again, if you think about outreach as building community, this program is absolutely doing it on all different kinds of levels. All kinds of people are hearing these young people's voices and they are out there making friends and talking about interesting things and talking about the things that they're passionate about. That's a lot of what community is about. So we're not saying, hey, this is a library event. But like the library is behind all of it, and so at the same time, the library is building an amazing reputation. We're not doing it to gain. We're not running the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate program so the rep, so the library will be like, hey, the library is fantastic. But by running the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate program, the library is building a really wonderful reputation. The young people speak, say wonderful things about the library and the program, and so um, by building community, we are also at the same time um, enriching the, the library. All right, so on to Ready, Set, Connect, a program I, I was running a, a few years ago. Um, so Ready, Set, Connect is a youth development, tech-focused uh, youth professional development program, um, and really with the goal of, of 
uh, bridging the digital divide. So we would work on uh, soft skills with young people, um, and they would also get exposure to the tech industry, get some work experience, um, really great program. I was actually introduced to that program as an intern, so I was one of the youth in it. Um, and kind of like Stephanie, I kind of fell in love with the library world, uh, ended up running the program, uh, getting hired as a permanent staff, uh, and now in my MLIS program to hopefully become a librarian soon. Um, so this is just from 2017 to 2018, so just one year. Uh, we had over 650 hours of that were dedicated to on one-on-one -on -one help with patrons uh, to bridging the digital literacy divide. And we had over uh, 1,200 sessions um, in nine different branches. So what this does is you're both having young people talk about the library, uh, be a part of the library, maybe even getting hired by the library because we hired a lot of the young people who were in that program um, to be library aides, library assistants. Um, but in addition to that, you're also building connections with the community. They're seeing friendly faces. Folks are learning the digital literacy skills at the library, which we know is a really huge uh, issue that we're grappling with now. And uh, yeah, so it's essentially what we're trying to tell you is, so both of those programs were run by uh, paraprofessionals, right? Um, the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole thing. Uh, so we know that uh, librarianship, librarians are not super diverse for the most part. I know it's a little different in the Bay Area, but we, we know the stats, it's, it's, it doesn't look great. Um, so your, your non-librarians and your prior professionals are going to be key to the outreach you do. Um, and so we, we must ask you to really examine your institution and ask yourself who makes up your staff. Yeah, so let's talk about the D word, which is diversity. It's a big hot buzzword. I think like it's great to see different organizations and different realms of the workforce and uh, the public really catching up. But we really also want to emphasize and examine like what does diversity mean? What does it look like? How do you know your staff is actually diverse? And like in the context of a library system, like does your library value your paraprofessional staff? Do you recognize and really think about like the different skills that they bring, especially given like the rich life experiences that you have, like a lot of um, like thinking about where, especially like the racial and ethnic diversity, where is it concentrated in your staff? Is it primarily your paraprofessionals? Are they is it coming up to the librarians as well? And like thinking about how do you measure that and how do you know you're not just potentially using people for optics like even if you don't intend to like look at how diverse our staff is but really looking at them as full people to develop folks that you can go to who have knowledge who have wisdom and really folding them into the planning and um, work processes sooner not like oh can you help me like hand out more, more flyers but like thinking about what perspectives they bring. So how do you know that your staff is diverse? How can you measure it? Who shares your views? How do you value them? And making sure that those folks feel supported as well. And it's a reciprocal relationship and not potentially using them at like opportune moments. So yeah, and how do you know that they find their work meaningful and not just like, oh, I like my job, but like whatever they're bringing to the table is fully recognize that you see him as a whole person and that you know especially like I work as an aide and a lot of the things can be clerical and that's part of the job duty sure but like it's really exciting when people ask me about other opportunities that align with my interests and skills and areas in which I have expertise but like are we asking that question to everyone even if people don't know about me are you asking that of all your staff and really thinking about do I know who my staff is do I know them as people mm -hmm. outside of the library so uh, does the diversity of your the diversity of your staff? Because I hear it all the time. Oh, our our library is so diverse. It's so diverse. Um, but where is the diversity concentrated? Is it that all of the lesser paid folks is that where the diversity is, and all the folks who have uh, you know full compensation uh, less less diversity there? Um, things to ask. And something we hear all the time, not just in tech, but also for librarians, it's a pipeline issue. Is it really? <laughs> <laughs> so 
So some things, again, to ask or push for or advocate for. Um, do you all provide mentorship? So OPL uh, has uh, informal, informal mentorship opportunities for people who are interested in the MLIS. Uh, and that's been a huge source of help. Um, Hassan, I see, helps to run that. Um, do you allow for flexible scheduling for, for students, right? Students who are embarking in the MLIS degree. Um, do you have money to make that happen, uh, right? Because uh, money is uh, obviously also a racial and class issue, who gets to have wealth and not. Um, and do you have job shadowing opportunities? And then um, if I could like yeah. mention one thing um, that all three of us talked about in our CLA presentation, but each one of us had also people in our corner, like people to support us, not just in these very specific, like library specific ways, but like folks we knew would have our back that we could talk to, that we could troubleshoot, that we could like vent to. And like being that person for your non-librarian staff has been really key it can be really key, especially for retaining your staff, for keeping them in the work, for keeping them happy, and just you know knowing where folks are at. Um, so again, to point out, uh, are there real chances for development? And the reason that we're focusing a lot on the paraprofessional staff is because a lot of that staff belongs to the community that you serve, right? A lot of times they're local to that neighborhood, local to that city, uh, and oftentimes the librarians are not. Um, so this is why this is a focus. And so, yeah. Oh, is that me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, like, like Steph was saying, there was always somebody who got us into this work that we have loved and developed. Um, in 2012, when the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate program started, I was, I was volunteering for it because I'd been working with young people for decades, and I had been working, doing community writing workshops uh, in, the, in, in Oakland for years, and so I, I jumped on the bandwagon and was doing this uh, even not as an employee. Um, and it would have been kind of crazy to, as opportunities developed, to not plug me into them. It would have not been taking advantage of my skills and my network. Um, and, but we need to be doing that in a way that's not just um, to, to put a name on. Like, if you're doing, if you're doing a project with, with, I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, let's talk about, um, no. <laughs> if you're <laughs> going to try to go back to something they said this morning, but I think I won't. Um, if you if you're if you're developing a program, for example, there's a lot of Guatemalans in your um, in your community, and you and you want to be doing a program with, with Guatemalans. If you like in, invite somebody from Guatemala to come to the program, but you're not developing that program with them, then then y y there's no you're y it's going to be hard to get it, it right and to really look at what those folks need. That was just throwing an example out there. And so me as somebody from the writing community being a part of this program, it made sense, but you don't want to tokenize anybody either. It's not just to look good. It's not just, as Steph said earlier, the optics of it. Um, so really looking at if you're tokenizing or exploiting your paraprofessional para staff, I think we can. Mm -hmm. Compensation is a big one, just putting that out there. So how do you know the depth and diversity and skills of your para paraprofessional colleagues? Um, again, like Steph said earlier, there was a couple people who really advocated for me, um, librarians who were like, Peggy needs to be doing this, and, and with a lot of patience and on all of our parts, <laughs> we made it happen. And so eventually I was, I was running the program, or mostly running the program. Um, so acknowledge the uh, skills and experience of your paraprofessional staff, honor their input, experience, and perspective. Um, you have to know them in order to do that and recognize and, and credit their efforts always. And again, not just by tokenizing them so you can say, oh, yeah, I asked my aide about that, but really see what that person has to offer. And this includes, um, you know, it's not just paraprofessionals. Librarians of color have to do the, deal with this all the time. So, um, you know, for white librarians, please also be very mindful about the ideas that you're stealing from people and not crediting or supporting fully because that's a big one. Um, go ahead, Andrea. Oh. Uh, again, so uh, opportunities, the whole, the whole purpose really is like, is it meaningful? Are folks actually developing in their positions? Um, yes, we have mundane, everyone has mundane work that they have to do, um, but we have to be extremely mindful about how folks are developing because if they're not really developing, they're not gonna talk great about the, the workplace and that's gonna reflect on the community, especially considering if the bulk of your paraprofessionals are from the community that you're serving, 
Um, you know, people, people aren't quiet when they don't like their jobs. Uh, they vent, uh, and that does not reflect very well because those people's moms, kids, sisters, brothers come to the library. Yeah, I think it's, uh, if we could go back one slide real quick, it's also important to recognize that while we want more opportunities to offer professional de development to folks, if they're also not down with it, then you gotta kind of leave it at that too. Like respecting if they decline, like cause there's so many different factors on like why they it might not be a good fit or why they don't want it. And like I can speak from experience, it's really hard to manage up. I think like if you can go back to any work experience you've had and you've had to try to talk with a supervisor or talk with someone and just the power dynamics in play, it is so hard to say no and not feel like it reflects badly on you that like you're gonna like it's gonna mess up your chances. So don't make any assumptions about what they want or what they need, but don't make assumptions also about their backgrounds and experiences too. Like this is why it's really key, not just building relationships outside the community, but within your community and the community of the library, your staff, your team that you see every day. So we recommend um, both uplifting and collaborating uh, with your paraprofessional staff, setting up support systems. Everybody needs somebody to be advocating for them and listening to them. Um, and advocating them, just, you know, again, one individual can make a huge difference. Advocate for para para paraprofessionals, um, especially if they're usually part of the communities that, that you are aiming to, to serve. Yeah, and to speak on the point of setting up support systems, again, like you want to be able to get input from those folks, have them part of the conversation, and making sure that even if you have a system in place, it's not inaccessible, it's not hard to get to, it's not hard to approach, and that people feel like they can go to it. Like, it's, it doesn't mean much if you have something in place and no one feels empowered to use it, you know? Um, so for those of you who are lucky enough to grab a zine, and since lots of you are librarians, you can know how to make a zine or you can look it up. This is a zine. Um, we have some, this is basically, these two slides that we're not gonna go through are basically some hard questions to ask yourself when you're designing a program uh, or serving a particular community. Um, and for those who want a PDF, please email me because I can do that. Oh, oh, we have time, okay, cool. Oh, I mean, that was really. Well, we're gonna do questions. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, thank you uh, so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah, just, um, I Please guess. Please email us if you have questions. Again, if you want copies of the PDF, the Xena as a PDF. Um, you know, strongly recommend it. Yeah, and I guess a little more context for this amazing zine that Andrea put together, and it's really cute. Um, it's an asset rec recognition exercise that we had in a previous version of this presentation that we can't go over in depth today, but you can take it home with you, fold it up, you have to make at least one cut and get a pair of scissors, but those are in the back also with some postcards. Not that the scissors, just the zine. Not the scissors. Yeah. Uh, the zine template um, and there are also postcards in the back kind of talking about the Open Youth Poet Laureate program. Peggy and I also can tell you more about it, mostly Peggy, because she's like running the program. Um, yeah. Because ultimately, right, com community is the asset, right? Without community, without folks actually believing what we do, libraries are nothing. They're just a bunch of people working in a building, feeling really great about themselves. Um, so we have to be real loving and also very critical about um, how we conduct our business. Yeah. yeah we got questions. Yeah. Do you have time for Q questions? Q&A. Two questions. Yeah. So you, there was something in the, an early slide that said outcomes or experiences, not outcomes or something. Do you have, do you evaluate any of your outreach events or programs where it's, you know, someone says to you, you say, we had a great event, we talked to 30 people, and they say, only 30 people? Yeah, you're not doing that next year. Like, is this measured, and how do you measure it? Um, because I find, like, a lot of times with outreach events, it's like, well, did you issue new cards? Well, did that person come into the library? Did they check out a big old stack of books? And that's how they measure outcomes. Do you have a way of measuring your outcomes? or? Yes, so that, that's a hard one. I work at the community relations office and that's something that we think about all the time. Um, but again, it's having to make the case that the relationships are what's gonna pay off in the, in the end. But I know that can be very difficult to make because people do look at the numbers. So I mean, I think that's why a lot of folks rely on a lot of on the qualitative data. 
whatever stories that you can get from people, whatever, like, especially if you do evaluations and folks say something, or if you can find a way to ask a question that highlights um, kind of the work that you're doing. But ultimately, again, the more you focus on those relationships, it takes time, right? But that's how you're gonna get more people through the doors, and that's how you're gonna see, or really build that trust with the community. I think another thing to mention too is, um, like out, like giving out flyers, being present and available and visible at events is still really important, but we don't want people to fall into the trap of, that's the only type of um, outreach we're gonna do, the only ones that we can measure, because again, like you don't know whatever's going on outside of that moment of you giving them the flyer, or like a lot of things in my experience and others that I've talked to, is through word of mouth. Like even just me working at the library and me telling all my friends and family, like look at all this stuff we have, none of us knew about, it. I didn't know about it before I started working there. And they've been telling all their friends, like it's amazing how much uh, information travels through the community, but we couldn't exactly capture that, but knowing that there are ways in which it'll come back to you and at least having a good reputation and being like in good standing with your community, like there isn't much of a way to really quantify that in my opinion. Yeah, let me piggyback on that real quickly. It, with, the, with the two examples that we gave you, the goal was not outreach, right? The outcome is outreach, right? but not the goal. And so, and so it's, not, it's not really being measured in that way either, but at the same time, you can see how many people we, re we reach. But if you think about outreach as, as relationship building, that signing up people for library cards shouldn't be so much about how many library cards, it's what kind of interaction did you have when you were signing them up? Did you de start developing, de developing a relationship? Did you get to know that person? Did that person get to know anything about the library in that process? It's about that opportunity to engage with them, in my opinion, much more than it is, is, is about them walking away with a library card that they may or may not use if they don't still if they don't feel something new and exciting about the library and feel welcome there. Good question, though. <laughs> Hi, great presenta presentation. Um, my name is Meg Dean. I'm a library aide at Oakland Public Library. <laughs> and I'm wondering, how do you, you know, as the lesser paid person in this library, how do you work with that while also doing extra labor and like having that on your shoulders as maybe being the only person of color in your branch um, and having all these great ideas, but you know, they're not really reciprocated. Um, and then also where do you find your inspiration or are there people that you follow online where you get creativity ideas and things like that? I know you work with the community as well, but what kind of online communities do you work with to get inspired? That's really that good. That was a lot. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a great question. I actually, I struggle with this all the time, um, a lot, uh, because I do a lot. Um, I think a lot of the onus is like how, making the right kind of partnerships and allyships within the library, especially as a person of color, is really crucial. So like joining committees or going to people outside of like your specific bubble getting involved with your union. Um, things like this can really help because if you are like in a certain case where you are a little bit more isolated, it's really hard to do that. And especially if you're the only person of color, the likelihood of your labor being exploited is extremely high. Um, and so going out of your way to really reach out to folks who you don't already know, especially other librarians of color, because there are far and few and librarians of color are the ones who have been helping me for example, like make it through and help me advocate for myself and figure out like what's appropriate for me to do, what's appropriate for me not to do, um, and where do we draw those lines, right? Like where is it gonna be beneficial to me? Um, as much as I wanna do everything for the library, I also wanna be compensated for the work that I do. And if I'm doing more than some of my peers who get paid way more than I do, um, it, it gets to the point where it's like, so we have to also always analyze that, it's like how much am I gaining how is it gonna help me in the long run? Obviously, also helping the community that I'm, I'm serving. Um, but I mean, making those connections, especially with other people of color, um, is kind of like, at least in my personal experience, super crucial. Yeah, um, something that I kind of wanna bring back to is like having folks in your corner and like knowing who you can go to as well. And this will serve like in multiple ways, whether it's like, I have ideas for things that I wanna do and maybe they're not being super well received uh, where I'm at, um, but knowing maybe there's other folks I can go to. And then yeah, being able to just get the experience of like, I, um, 
just figuring out how you can say no to things and like what supports and what systems and um, just how it operates in place. We're out of time, it looks like. Um, but definitely just having those folks that you trust and you can come to and they have other resources and other folks they can connect you to is really vital. Twitter and Facebook have lots of real snarky, great groups full of really loud people who have lots of inspiration and programs. I'm happy to share some of that with you, yeah. But yes, thank you again so much for thank having you. us.